Okay. So welcome everyone uh, to this week's POTS seminar. We have a great pleasure of having uh, Scott Clark here today. He works at Yelp. Gave you a nice little demonstration. in real time there <laughs> doing his tech hacking or uh, updating his slides. So no PowerPoint for Scott, obviously. <laughs> Does it all himself. <clears throat> um, anyway, Scott uh, has had a pretty good career. Got his PhD in Cornell in machine learning and uh, before that was at Oregon State in, in mathematics. I guess teaching mathematics. But Oregon State was pretty good. Thank you. Oh, okay. But definitely moving into the sort of the involved now with Yelp and the machine learning kind of side of things. And uh, so looking at the data side underneath there under the hood. So uh, given that we also do machine learning here on our campus, I think this will be of great interest to you all. And uh, he's just up the road in San Francisco if you ever want to talk to him again. So I'll let Scott take it away from here. Excellent. Thank you for that introduction. So. Uh, like Stephen said, uh, I'll be talking about uh, some machine learning tricks that uh, we use at uh, Yelp. Um, I'm going to be mostly talking about the multi-arm bandit problem. Um, and I will apologize in advance if like, your thesis is on that. Uh, this is more of an intro level. Whoa. This is more of an intro level talk. Uh, I'm going to be motivating it, showing some te techniques, um, showing some of the current research in it, and then explaining how we use it at Yelp and other web companies tend to use it. Uh, the more application side of it. Um, so I'll try to make this as accessible as possible and try to motivate everything uh, intuitively and uh, with pictures and stuff. So uh, the talk itself, uh, like I said, is going to be mostly about the multi arm bandits. I'm going to give an introduction of what this is, uh, why we care about it, and how it works. Um, and then motivate that with some examples, some graphs, and then talk about extending it. So the setup is this. Um, Imagine you're, you walk into a casino and there's K slot machines in front of you. And all of these slot machines are set to free play, but you can still win money. So every slot machine has an unknown and possibly different payout. And the goal is, under some fixed amount of time or some fixed amount of pulls on these slot machines, you want to maximize the amount of money you can gain. So there can be some large number of them. I say there's 10, there's 10 20 of them. You have 100 plays. Make as much money as possible. Just go nuts. So what do you do? Um, a more mathematical version of this is pretend there's k random variables, unknown payout distributions. At each time interval, you observe one of these random variables, and you get a payout. And note, when you observe one of them, you know nothing about the other ones. They go completely unobserved. And you want to maximize this expected total reward. So there's a long history of this problem. It's been well studied uh, for over 60 years now. So certain aspects of it are solved for certain types of bandits, certain different distributions, certain numbers. Um, there's still a very vibrant area of research. So uh, these were, I, when I initially gave this talk, it was right at the beginning of January, like January, early first week of January, there was already a slew of papers published on this. Um, Web companies in particular have started becoming very interested in this. So here's Microsoft Research, Yahoo, Google, um, many other tech companies are starting to really look into this and attack it. And why do they do that? Well, it maps extremely well onto the click-through rate problem. So I work on the ads team at Yelp. And so one of the problems is we want to show an ad and we want the user to click on it. That's how we get paid. That's how the, the business works. So you can think of each ad as an individual one of these bandits. And then the user will go up. I mean, every possible ad you can show is one of these multi-arm bandits, one of these slot machines. And then by showing it to a user, you're effectively sampling it. You're pulling that arm. If the user clicks on it, you get a payout. If the user doesn't click on it, then you don't get a payout. But that's still information. So you want to maximize the number of clicks given some time period and given some set of slot machines or advertisers. Another thing that this can be used for is A-B testing. 
Google uh, on their tech blog recently published how they can use this to accelerate their A-B testing. So the way that A-B testing works is you have two different versions or n different versions of your website that you want to show. And you show some fraction of users each particular part. They're in individual cohorts. And then you want to see which one performs better under some metric. Just one second. And so well, this metric could be higher click-through rate, higher user engagement, however you want to define this. But instead of just running this experiment for some fixed period of time and picking a winner, maybe you want to start biasing towards something that's clearly better earlier on. Something that's clearly terrible, you don't necessarily need to get like high statistical confidence that it's only a 10% click-through rate instead of a 90%. You're fine with an error bar of 15% or something like that. And you want to just, just compare the two that are going to actually show what's, what's good or not. Yes, there's a question. So yes, that's true. Um, the, and bandits can be extended so that they're not independent in between calls. Um, uh, for the examples that I'll show, at least initially, I'm going to assume independence. But you can take past information. Um, sometimes it can change over time, stuff like that. I'll, I'll get to those extensions towards the end. But thank you, that's an excellent point. OK, so this is obviously a problem that a lot of people are trying to tackle. There's a lot of money behind this problem. And it's maybe not super intuitive how it works. But the underscoring part of it is it's a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. So if I have 100 different slot machines in front of me, do I explore all of them? Do I want to make sure that I know a lot of information about every individual piece before I start to exploit and really try to get as much money as possible? Or after a certain period of time, do I stop exploring? Do I start saying, OK, now I want to be able to just exploit. I want to make as much uh, money or clicks, or whatever it is, off of the information that I've obtained so far. So it's knowledge about the system versus getting the largest payout with whatever your current knowledge is, which may be imperfect. And with this, we can define something called regret, which is the difference between the best possible reward, saying we knew the best possible one. So in this case, uh, I guess we should have that copy. In this case, this is the best possible arm we can pull. And this is the one that we actually pull at a time t. Any strategy that has exploration will inherently have regret as part of it because you're not going to get the, the best one every single time. But at the same time, it's all about bounding this regret. It's about minimizing it and making sure that over whatever time period you're working on, you're getting as much as you possibly can. So here's an example of a very naive approach. So back to the slot machines in the beginning, 10 in a room, I just say, OK. Just sample randomly for 20 minutes and then exploit for 40 minutes. Let's say you have an hour. And so for some time epsilon times t, where epsilon is less than 1, only explore. And then whatever you found the best, this is just that's your knowledge of the system, just exploit at that point. So does this work? So here's an example. Three slot machines. Let's pretend that we know their actual payout rates above. This is something that you wouldn't know in the actual system. And then let's just start sampling these. Let's say we sample them nine times. Like, yay, we won. Oh, no, yay, et cetera. So now after nine uh, observations, we say that, oh my gosh, this one in the middle is great. These other ones, uh, not so much. But at this point, we're going to say, we're not exploring anymore. This is our knowledge about the system. Let's just exploit. Sample the middle one forever. All right, just go nuts. It works, right? Well, in this current setup, it actually would work. So we've accidentally picked the very best one. We're going to have zero regret for the rest of the system. We have that initial regret while we're exploring, but zero regret at this point. But these distributions could very well have been this. It's slightly less likely, but it very well could have been this. And now we're picking something that's tied for the worst bandit every single time from this time on. And if we only have one more sample to do, maybe that's not that big of a loss. But if we're going to do this a million times, or if I'm going to set this up as the algorithm that's going to run at Yelp for the next year, then all of a sudden there's just a ton of amount of regret. It's completely unbounded. So the amount of exploration needs to depend on the data that's coming in and also what you're learning about the system as you go. So we need better policies. And thankfully, people have spent their entire careers developing great policies. You could spend your entire academic career, write your thesis on all sorts of different things. There's hundreds of them. Um, some of them are very famous. Some of them are used uh, quite a bit in industry. And some of them are less well known or tackle a very specific problem. So I'm going to 
go and compare four of them right now. So uh, different than the one that I showed or, or originally. So weighted random choice, epsilon greedy, two very standard ones that you can look up on Wikipedia, and there's lots of examples. UCB tuned, uh, and UCB stands for uh, upper confidence bound. This is a standard one that people have been working on and publishing on quite a bit, very much used in, uh, in a lot of different industries. And then a lesser known one called the Bayesian Learning Automaton, which has gained some popularity at uh, web companies. So weighted random choice is exactly what it sounds like. You're going to do a random choice weighted by whatever success probability you've seen so far. So a certain arm has a certain number of successes, and you've pulled it a certain number of times, and then you just pull with that weighted probability. So if one of them wins a third of the time, and another one wins two-thirds of the time, you're going to you're going to show one a third of the time and one two thirds of the time. Um, and it, the problem with this is it doesn't exploit enough. So if you have high statistical uh, confidence that one of them's two thirds and one of them's one third, then you should never be pulling that one third. Or you should only be pulling it very infrequently just to make sure that that's an accurate representation of its underlying payout distribution. But if you just use this, then you're going to be pulling it quite a bit. So here's an example. Um, the actual payouts are going to be uh, up at the top. So arm one is a payout 0.6, arm two 0.3. Um, this is what we've sampled so far. So red is um, our underlying uh, sample average. And then gold is the probability that we're going to actually select that arm. So just running like just a random uh, sample using random number generator. These are starting to correct themselves down towards their actual averages as we sample more and more. But we're sampling this bad one quite a bit. Like, there's no reason once we have sampled enough that we should be continuing to sample it. Um, so an, an approach, so that will have unbounded regret. Um, an approach that has bounded regret, regret is uh, epsilon greedy. So you just pick the best arm so far with probability 1 minus epsilon. So like 99% chance, just go with whatever's the best so far. And then explore with some epsilon amount. So this allows you to bound how much you're actually exploring by some fixed hand-tuned parameter epsilon, or you can have it decay with time or something like that. But at the same time, you're exploiting quite a bit. Um, so there's a hand-tuned parameter, which is kind of bad. Um, but it does pretty well in, in general, um, especially if they're very disparate distributions. One problem with this, though, is that if, like in this example, if arm one has a probability of 0.1 of success and arm two is a 0.8, there can arise a time where just because you haven't sampled enough, one of them looks much better than the other, and you're going to be stuck on that for quite a while. If epsilon's very small, you're not going to be exploring very much. So you can get yourself into these little ruts where it's like, oh, I think this is the best right now, but in actuality it's not. But I'm not going to give myself enough time to really explore to correct this mistake that I've made. So here's an example where arm two is much better than arm one, but because we just did random sample twice to begin with, we're going to be sampling one quite a bit. That gold bar represents the probability that we're going to be sampling it, with epsilon being 10%. And then eventually that epsilon kicks, and we're like, oh my gosh, this is actually a much better arm. And you have this very stark transition. So that's another downside with this, is you're going from, and if you're showing something on the web, um, you're going from something like, oh, let's have Yelp be blue versus let's have Yelp be red. And red's the traditional one for people who don't actually know that much about Yelp. But it can be very uh, harsh on your users to have these transitions where instead of sliding from one to the other or having it be proportional about some underlying distribution, um, it's just like, okay, we're going to go from 99% this to 99% this. There's no gradual transitioning that can be upsetting. Um, so here's a more principled approach. Um, this is uh, one of the UCB tuned, uh, UCB variants. This is UCB tuned. Um, basically the way to think about this is it's similar to the weighted random choice. There's this, there's this mean here, which is the sample uh, average of the number of uh, successes you have. And then think about this as the amount of confidence we have in the system. Um, or the, the weight in which, um, if we don't sample an arm for a long period of time, this other factor will grow. Notice that it rises with T. And then it decreases with the number of samples. So as we sample something more and more frequently, we're gonna, this extra parameter is going to go down. If we leave it alone for a long time, this is going to go up. So the idea is 
you'll be exploiting when you know a lot about something, but if you leave something on the back burner too long, you're gonna wanna go in and sample it every so often just to make sure it hasn't changed while you weren't looking. Um, so one potential downside with this is that it's deterministic. So you're just gonna pick the highest weighted parameter in this at any given time. And this is fine if you're allowed to update your strategy and you're allowed to get everything in real time, but it turns out in real life, uh, or at least in web companies, a lot of times you can't, if you're getting 100 million users or something like that, you can't necessarily log everything fast enough, you can't update your databases fast enough, so you need to batch everything. And this determinism can play a bad role in that because if you get yourself in a rut, if you have something on the back burner that's truly bad, and then this algorithm says, hey, we should sample this because we haven't done it in a while, it might have changed, well, until you update your algorithm, you're gonna be sampling that really poor one even though it can immediately tell that it's actually as bad as you thought it was initially. So here's an example where uh, the two arms are fairly close to each other, um, but it's deterministic. So it's only gonna pick the one that it was the best. And then as you switch the batch, it's gonna be like, oh, okay, now I've updated all my weighting parameters. Now I'm gonna only pick this one until the next batch happens. And similar to in an even more stark version of what was happening with Epsilon Greedy, we're switching back and forth very rapidly and this can be jarring to the user, or you can get yourself stuck in a situation where you're only sampling something for a very long period of time. So you can see just jumping back and forth because they're very close. So here's one that uh, is not necessarily potentially as principled as some of the other ones. It doesn't have quite as much uh, research gone into it as like some of the UCB algorithms. Um, it was uh, published in a, a conference uh, a few years ago, but it turns out that it works fairly well with um, the types of data that web companies have. Small uh, percentage reward chances um, spread across many different things. Um, so here's, the original paper was written for only two arms. So you basically just make a beta distribution based off of the successes and number of pulls um, for each of the different arms. And then you observe uh, random variables from that, uh, drawn from that distribution. And whichever one's larger, you just pull that arm. So this is kind of difficult to intuit. Uh, I, when I first saw this, I had to look up the beta distributions. Basically the way that it works is um, as this first parameter goes up, it's usually alpha, um, the mass of the distribution is shifted to the right. And as this other parameter goes up, the mass of the distribution is shifted to the left. So if you think about it, um, as you have more and more successes, the probability that you're gonna draw a large number from this distribution is higher. So more successes means it's gonna be more likely to be chosen, less successes, less likely to be chosen. And uh, the, the way that it was published, it only supports two arms, but you can imagine extending this to just making N betas, and it turns out it works pretty well. Um, although getting the uh, asymptotic bounds on regret is a little bit more difficult, which is why it's only for two arms, but once again, in industry, and I know this is a lot different than academia, if it works and it makes money, then it's okay if the asymptotics maybe don't work out. Um, slightly different uh, <laughs> goals here. Um, but at the same time, you can see uh, this is just an example of two arms that are very similar to each other. Um, you're getting close distributions across each other and it's zooming in on what's the actual distribution. Uh, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, they're uh, samples from those random variables. Samples from random variables. So how exactly does this work? So you try like n one, n two times from arm one, arm two, your first success one, second success. So yeah, let's say uh, we've sampled uh, uh, arm one ten times and arm two ten times, and there's one success and nine successes. You fit the beta distribution to that, and then this beta distribution, um, if you look at the the PDF, I should have made a slide for this. If you uh, look at the PDF, it's gonna have a lot of its mass off to the right between zero and one. And the other one's gonna have a lot of its mass off to the left. And then when you sample from those distributions, you're gonna get, in expectation, the X2 will be larger than the X1. And the math uh, is non-trivial for two, and you can it's difficult to get like proper asymptotic regret bounds for this. 
And then once you extend it to n, it becomes even more difficult. So you actually sample. Because if you just took the mean, then it would be deterministic. It, it would be closer to UCB. I won't go all the way back. Yeah. Uh, so as you get more information in, you update, uh, but you can have it batched. So you can give it a, a, a whole bunch of successes and pulls, um, but in between batches, you're still going to be doing what is statistically a good approach. Yes. I have a technical question. Can you use this one? Uh, can you just build parameters in this sample over here, or how would you how would you fit those parameters into that sort of learning graph? Is this pure okay? Yeah. yeah so and then. Uh, so if I recall, beta is basically for like bimodal stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So would because for the generalization, shouldn't one just use a multimodal have a Driscoll trial? So uh, is that what one would use in practice, or yes? Um, but you don't necessarily need it to sum to one. Oh, okay. You can just make them like okay. Yeah. 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 But and uh, also, how how do the asymptotic or get dots so you can use the SOP to compare? Um. Let's see. So uh, I think for the standard uh, epsilon greedy, it's logarithmic. Um, I think they they might actually all be logarithmic um, with respect to time, but there's lots of parameters that go into there as as a, like what the actual um, values that you're setting within it. Um, and so one thing that actually comes up quite a bit though is you're not, so in the traditional academic sense, you're only trying to find something that has the lowest regret for whatever problem that you're trying to tackle. And then you're trying to do that across uh, many different distributions of payouts. But uh, in reality, or at least when you're dealing with like advertising, you're, you have many different arms, all very low in the, the spectrum uh, in terms of payout rate. Uh, tr turns out people don't click on ads most of the time. Um, Unfortunately for, for me, but um, <laughs> uh, you need something that works well in that in that domain. And I'll actually show a quick graph here um, comparing some of these things. But uh, you don't necessarily care as much about the asymptotics because the amount of time that would need to get there is so far that all of your advertisers are paying for anyway. Um, you just need something that works relatively well for some short period of time, given whatever set of parameters that you're there's different approaches for what you're doing. So if you're trying to find like the fail rate of a mechanical part or something like that, which is what some of the original um, papers were written on, then some of the other uh, techniques work very well, but BLA tends to work well on the web search. Um, so it depends on uh, which what ad you're showing and where. I know that uh, Facebook has published numbers as low as for the side ads. Um, where it's kind of off, um, and people tend to ignore them, as low as like 0.04%. Um, Google has published, or people have published who use Google, numbers as high as like 10%, uh, or in, into that uh, order for ads uh, for a very targeted search, where like if you look up shoes or something like that, like 50% of the page is going to be ads. Or if you look up eBay or something, it's going to have the, the ad for eBay right underneath the search bar, and you get quite a huge jump. Yelp doesn't publish its numbers, but it's in between those two. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to show a quick little example. Um, so this is going to take a second to parse. Um, so, which is always the case when you're trying to show four-dimensional data. But, um, so basically what we're looking at is, let's say we have two different ads or two different arms that we want to show. And their true payout rate is on the axes. So arm one is down here and has a payout rate between 0% and 5%. And then arm two has a payout rate between 0% and 5%. And... What we're comparing here is 
um, over some small number of Monte Carlo runs that I did on my way here. Um, the expectation in the, the, the relative difference in the payout between weighted random choice and BLA. So I'll say that again. So let's say uh, ARM1 has a 3% chance of succeeding and ARM2 has a 1% chance of succeeding. So we'll be right here. Um, given zero impressions, given no initial information, um, oh, I guess I'm going to bias this one more time, actually. So we're going to assume that weighted random choice has perfect knowledge, that there's an oracle that's been running long enough that it has a perfect idea of what these actual distributions are. So the goal is to show that BLA can actually outperform that even when it's learning as it goes. So weighted random choice is so bad that even with perfect knowledge, it's still going to get beat, and it's going to get beat relatively quickly. So this is a contour plot. I'm sure you're all aware of it, but just in case, um, it's like a, top, a topographical map. Everything within this is 8%. Anything within this is 16%. 24%, 32%. So with no impressions, weighted random choice destroys BLA. There's a few areas here where it does about the same when they're the exact same payout rate. But for the most case, it pretty much uh, wins every time. But as we start to sample more and more impressions, this becomes less true. So those are the three dimensions. And now we're going through time. Um, and as we sample more and more impressions up there, so we're at 300 right now, um, there's these pockets where if uh, there's a 4% payout for one and a 2% for another, all of a sudden BLA can start to exploit that difference. And like I said before, weighted random choice has a problem with once it knows information, it doesn't exploit it enough. So we've given it full information. We've cheated and said that it gets full access to the oracle. But it's not exploiting. And as this continues on and on, this is why I have sliding here. Um, after a thousand iterations, there's these large swaths where it's like, oh, okay, um, BLA is like wildly outperforming it. And let's say we just go up to 3,000, which if you can imagine a website that's getting hundreds of millions of hits, you can show 3,000 ads pretty quick. Um, almost all of the space is such that BLA is performing much better. 24% better in this huge section over here. And basically, whenever there's a difference between one arm and the other, you're going to see this. Um, because it's able to exploit. As the, the mass of those distributions shift to one side to the other, you're going to start really exploiting. You're still going to do a little bit of exploration, and you're going to be able to make sure that you have bounded regret. But at the same time, you're going to do a lot more exploiting. Um, so I don't know if I explained that properly. But uh, BLA is much, much better than weighted random choice, which you, you might come up with if, if this is the first time you saw this problem or something like that, or if at the beginning I told you that slot machine thing and I actually put them in front of you, or if this was actually a game in Vegas. That doesn't seem like that terrible of an idea, or maybe uh, Epsilon first isn't that terrible of an idea, but it turns out by using some of these more principled approaches, you can outperform it, you can outperform it very rapidly. Um, so there are similar graphs to this that I generated, but then. They show the exact same thing. Uh, UCB Tuned also performs extremely well in these pockets. You'll notice when they're the exact same, you can't do much better because weighted random choice is going to pick them 50-50, and that's what you want BLA to do, too. Um, UCB Tuned does it as well. It turns out when you compare UCB Tuned to, to uh, BLA, BLA actually does much better in this domain, where they're relatively small near the click-through rates. But in a larger domain, there are pockets where UCB tune does better. And unfortunately, I don't have that graph, but it's in the paper for UCB tune and BLA. Um, OK. So. There are many different strategies out there. Some of them are much, much better than others. Oh, God. Um, but so there, some of them are very domain specific. Or as it was pointed out earlier, they require things to be independent between each other. But in the real world, this isn't necessarily the case. Um, hardware constraints, as I mentioned early, earlier, can limit real-time knowledge. So if you need to be able to batch a system, one of these bandits may be extremely good if you can have that real-time update. 
but at the same time, it can perform extremely poorly when you don't. Um, and as I was mentioning before, sometimes if a lot of these algorithms were developed to just minimize asymptotic regret. But in the real world, you not only have to minimize that, but you also have to worry about the user experience. So like a rapidly shifting strategy may not be ideal for user engagement, even if it does lower regret in the short term. Um, Another set of uh, uh, bandits can work with dynamic content. So what if something changes over time? So this is a problem in some of the Yahoo papers that they published where you have a news story. And it's obviously this is like a super popular news story. Like Louisville just won the NCAA tournament. And we want to show that because lots of people are wanting to click on that. But at the same time, in a week, that might not be that useful anymore. In two weeks, in a year when someone else has won, obviously it's terrible. And in the future. But in, uh, if you aggregate that data, it can cluster the users, or you can do something to like smooth everything out, then you might be able to get a little bit of a, a, a bonus. Um, parallel sampling is another uh, amazing thing. So instead of just some sort of sequential design where uh, like you're doing drug trials or something like that, did this work, did this work, or something like that, if you have millions of users streaming into your site at any given time, um, can you use that to exploit certain certain probabilities uh, better, or certain certain bandits can be exploited um, entirely, and you just set some subset to exploration, or something like that. Um, and then, as the number of arms increases, as I said before, certain arms expire. But as you get new advertisers coming in, um, you need to be able to account for that and have you have it be updating and explore those new ones without necessarily exploring the ones that you've already explored quite a bit. Um, and as this becomes continuous, then it becomes somewhat of a global optimization problem. So if I'm trying to find um, the best parameter to show uh, distance for advertising or something like that, the, the, the exact distance we want to show an advertiser for, um, I could bucket it up and say, in every tenth mile increment, we're going to do a bandits problem or something like that. But once again, these are very correlated with each other because point 0.1 is much more similar to point 0.2 than it is to 1.1. And you can start to like use this as a, a global optimization problem where sampling is extremely expensive. And there's a whole swath of things in optimal learning that, uh, that go into this. But uh, I guess I blazed through that really quickly. But yeah, more questions. Another what if, which is, um I don't know, uh, within the multi-arm bandit setting, it probably needs to be generalized, but if a user needs to give, uh, can not just pull one one lever at a time, but they can pull, say, four or five different levers. Say, for example, I'm thinking about search rankings, right? So you mm -hmm. pull up uh, maybe top 10 uh, search results, and the users, user picks two, four, and seven. That's some kind of a structured output. You have some kind of a ranking there. So how does that kind of information then get incorporated? Um, so... 
as you said, it's structured, so you you have information about like where you you initially rank them, and that can that can help you switch the the information between them. Um, in general, there are the algor the algorithms that work with like parallel sampling, and I guess there's not any other ones that I put up here, but there are other algorithms out there that take into account that you're sampling many things at a given time, um, and you've put preference on them as well, and Usually, if a user samples something, they can't like click three things simultaneously. So some people approach this problem by only counting the last one, or only counting the one that like there was a successful transaction or something like that. And if there were multiple successful transactions, then you just count it as two independent successes. But uh, from the uh, advertising perspective perspective, Yelp only shows one ad, so I haven't done a ton of uh, depth into that, but as I said before, 60 years of research, lots of different, uh, depending on what your exact problem is in the domain, there's many different ways to tackle it, yeah, many different variations. Any other questions? Cool. I wanted to show something else here at the end as well. Um, so Yelp recently uh, released an, a brand new academic data set. Um, so we had one in the past that was uh, based around specific um, really good uh, uh, universities, uh, computer science universities so like the CMU campus in Pittsburgh and stuff like that. We showed just a, a sparse uh, sampling of businesses around those universities. Um, and now we've released this new one where it's the entire greater Phoenix area. It's a uh, representative sample of what the website looked like at a specific day. Um, so it's thousands and thousands of businesses, and a little video I'll show out here. Um, you might recognize the guy in it. Um, so director's cut notes, uh, pay attention to the, the dart fight happening in the background, and the guy who's pushing all of the code to our uh, production uh, repository is right in the middle of the dart fight, desperately trying to work. Man, I'm so tired of these same old academic data sets. Wouldn't it be great if there was a deep, rich data set with tons of information right for natural language processing, graph, and general machine learning research? Here at Yelp, we've listened. We've taken in the entire Phoenix metropolitan area and created a massive data set of almost every review, user, check-in, and business that we have in easy-to-parse JSON format. This data can be used to train a myriad of models across many fields. Can you tell when during the day a business is likely to be more popular based off of its review content? Can you tell which business is likely to be reviewed next by a user? What makes a review useful, funny, or cool? To incentivize the use of this data set, we're also announcing the Yelp Data Set Challenge. Students who present proposals for how they'll use this data in their research will be eligible for a $5,000 reward with a bonus $1,000 and travel for publication in peer-reviewed journals and conferences. This data set contains over 200,000 reviews from over 40,000 users across over 10,000 businesses and their associated check-ins. The possibilities are endless, and we're happy to reward you for them. So check out this new unique data set and see what you can do. So yeah, basically, a bunch of data. Um, great for natural language processing. I know you guys do a whole bunch of different machine learning things here. Um, it's all available online. I mean, some of you have laptops. You can literally get it right now. Um, almost zero barriers. Um, all of it's really easy to parse. Um, it's just in standard JSON format, and then you can like convert it to CSV or whatever you need. Uh, Yelp has a ton of open source things as well. Uh, you can check out our GitHub page, just GitHub slash Yelp. Um, we have examples for the data set itself, but also uh, a whole bunch of different uh, techniques for data analysis. Um, a Python-based MapReduce framework, um, many different things uh, that can be useful for uh, attacking this problem and other problems as well. And then for the students of you here, um, I guess as a graduate student, five grand is a good chunk of money. So feel free to submit something, anything cool, uh, work on it over the summer, um, have fun with it. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about this as well. But the, the website's yelp.com, data set challenge. You can just get the data super easily. So, yeah.
Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think someone, I, I, there might have been a CMU grad who tried to get it out, probably only with Christopher Campus, but I will send something to you guys as well. We have like a, a form for it. But uh, all the information is also just here, yelp.com slash data breakdown. So yeah, it looks like it got sent out at some point. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll send it to. Them. So yeah, it's uh, a fun new data set. The idea was instead of uh, giving information that maybe you'd be familiar with, but having it be small and sparse, just give this huge swath of information. There's noise in it. There's some corrupt data in it that you're going to be able to find. Um, poor geocoding, um, everything like that. But there's just a ton of a ton of information. And there's a whole bunch of different problems you can tackle with this. So we're really excited to see what people can come up with. Um, we're publish stuff. Uh, we'll pay you. It's all good. Any uh, any questions about bandits or this? Uh, so yeah, the uh, if. You could use it in Las Vegas. So unfortunately, uh, so back when this was originally uh, done, I think it worked quite a bit better when machines would have vastly different payouts. Um, but now it's the bandits themselves are playing bandits. So uh, back in the day when it was mechanical, you had to set whether or not whether it was going to have a certain payout or not. But now it turns out, uh, and there's papers on this as well, um, the machines will dynamically change their payout rate based off of how many people are around it, uh, the time of the day, whether or not it's won a lot. So uh, while there may be bandit strategies that can take that into account, you're getting to the point where asymptotically, yeah, you might make a couple of bucks, but you're going to go broke before that happens. Yeah? So quick question on this challenge again. You, you're not looking for any particular result. No. On this, right? Just whatever people want to do. Yeah. So it's uh, so we wanted to design it like loosely off of like uh, the Netflix uh, prize, but also just off of giving academia as much information as we could. Because we, we were consistently getting people asking for like, hey, like can we have some data? And traditionally, you would have to try to scrape us, which we don't like, and we try to block. Um, and so we were just like, okay, we're going to give as much data as possible, but we also want to incentivize it. So instead of saying like, can you do 10% better than our engineers at this exact problem? Um, we're just looking for, use it in your research. I mean, if you already have something that's set up and can ingest a bunch of data, just throw this through and see what happens. Um, and, uh, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be about machine learning. If you've got friends in economics or anything like that, ingest census data, do whatever you want to, uh, to augment this. Um, there's just going through and just glancing through and playing with it, just like looking at what people of a certain name or something like that are like, can you correlate uh, the number of like swear words someone says to a, a review count or a, a star rating or something like that? There's there's just tons of just like little fun snippets in there. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, and actually in their paper, and maybe actually in the BLA paper, I think they try to downplay it, but um, I think, uh, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure that when there are arms that are have a high success ratio, like higher than 50%, um, and relatively distinct from each other, so like a 50% and a 70%, um, BLA will explore way too much. And uh, UCB tune will. So if you if you sample ten times and then what take the average or. So if effectively, I mean, you can solve for the the mean of those distributions, and if you just take those, then it, it's it, you do end up coming closer and closer to UCB tune, but it's a trade off. Uh, in general, and actually, it turns out, at least in practice, uh, it, it's just you pick a specific bandit for a specific task. So if it's something like, did someone click on any search result at all? 
uh, needs to be tuned might be better because it's going to have a much higher probability. Um, and if you're choosing between many different ads that have a very low success rate, then BLA tends to work out pretty well. And if you know information, like I was saying before, about the user or about the context or about how things are correlated, you can start to exploit this more and more. Um, although you do end up taking a penalty on the amount of data you need to store, how quickly you can update it, and how expensive it is. Um, on every single web request, doing a huge like um, correlation between users and like figuring out what's happening in the world and stuff like that might be too expensive. So eventually, you have to simplify. Any other questions? So you should definitely check out uh, the data set. Um, check out